We're good. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for the day. Um, you are so good to us. We love you, and we thank you for um, your mercy and your kindness and your grace. Um, thank you for all that you do, and uh, thank you, Father, for um, just the ability to study your word that you've given to us, and that, um, Father, we can learn from it and apply it to our lives Father, I pray that you would help us to walk worthy of the calling that you've called us to, and that, uh, Father, we would um, uh, share the love of Jesus with a, a world that needs um, a fresh touch and a reminder of your love and your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are going to be in Mark chapter 9 tonight. Mark chapter 9. Um, we're studying the book of Mark. Again, there's two parts. The first part is chapter 1 through um, chapter uh, 10, um, and that is the servant Jesus giving his life in service, showing us how to live our life in service. And the second part is the servant Jesus giving his life in sacrifice. And so we've um, considered section 1, um, the servant's work, the servant's work begun, belittled, blessed, and blasphemed, the servant's words uh, that were exact in purpose and in power, um, the servant's ways, the attitudes of others toward God's servant, and then last week we finished up the attitude of God's servant towards others. So we're going to begin section four tonight, uh, the servant's worth. Actually, we started that last time, the servant's worth, chapter 8, verse 27 through 9, 13, um, and so hopefully we'll get through uh, that tonight. We looked at, first of all, how that was recognized uh, we'll pick it up with B, how it was revealed, how it was revealed. So in the first section um, that we looked at the servant's worth, um, we saw that it was recognized uh, when Peter confessed Christ. He confessed him to be the Messiah, and then Christ um, in turn predicted his death, burial, and resurrection to those gentlemen. Um, and of course, Peter denied him that and said that he shouldn't say that, and of course, he knew who was really behind that, it was the devil, and then verse 34 through 38 is the section where he says to, um, to his disciples, uh, to all the people, uh, that um, they, if they want to follow him, they should take up their cross and follow him, okay, and that brings us to chapter 9 um, of Mark, how it was revealed, um, and so let's look at chapter 9, verse one, and begin with this question. And he said to them, who are them? It's a great question, isn't it? Who's he referring to? Who's he talking to? Who do you believe he's, he's referring to in, this, in that statement? Well, to understand that, you have to read the rest of the section to understand. He said to them, assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So who do you believe that he's talking to? This is one of those questions where, you know what, we really don't know, we're not sure for sure, but we think we know. Okay, could be all of just the disciples. Who else might it be? Okay, up in uh, 34, he had called the people to him, right? So if we go back to verse 34 of chapter 8, we see that there is a crowd of people, all right? Um, is he talking, is it another part where he's talking about just to the crowd of people, or now has he called his disciples aside? Or is it maybe because he's about to go to the Mount of Transfiguration that he's called Peter, James, and John to himself and said that? We're not sure at that point, um, and um, commentaries differ on their opinion. Um, some will say this, and some will say that, so we're really not sure. But it, it, it appears that he's um, referring to uh, the crowd of people that are there, that some of them will not be there, uh, some of them will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Okay? Um, so the pledge is he's talking... Um, he's talking to here the kingdom of God. Um, it, it, 
what is the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Okay. Okay, yeah, that's basically true. Um, the kingdom of heaven is anything under heaven, which is the world. Okay, the kingdom of God began when? With Jesus, right? And ends when? Jesus. Right? You want to say Jesus, right? Um, the kingdom of heaven exp- embraces all kinds of people. Um, the kingdom of God is eternal and spiritual. In other words, how do I get into the kingdom of God? John 3 itself, right? John 3, Nicodemus, you must be, you must be born again. So in order for me to come into the kingdom of God, I must be born again, okay? Um, I must be born again. Um, and so in, in, his, in his introduction to the uh, story of the transfiguration, uh, Matthew avoids his usual technical use of the expression kingdom of heaven and simply says, till the son of man coming in his kingdom. Again, Jesus coming in his kingdom. So Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? Why? What is he talking about? Thy kingdom come. What kingdom? The kingdom of God, which is what? What do we call that today? We call it the universal what? Church. Okay, the universal church. Um, That is what he's talking about when he says the kingdom of God. Um, The church came in grace and power at Pentecost. The disciples wanted to know if the Lord was about to set up the millennial kingdom. Was he? No. He was about to issue in a new way, and that way was the church. Um, uh, Soon, soon... What we are living in right now, the church age, will be over. When does the church age end? Yes, at the rapture. Um, And that will come and usher in the tribulation period, and then Jesus will come back on a white horse, and he will whip everybody. And that's a great way of saying it, right? He'll whip everybody. Uh, and we'll, we'll come with him and uh, go Jesus, and uh, uh, he'll set up his millennial kingdom. Um, but this, um, this event is going to be one that um, the transfiguration is going to look into. Um, Jesus is about, he's about to be dishonored. He's about to uh, be betrayed, to be giving a, given a mock trial before three earthly courts. He's about to be insulted. He's about to be beaten, uh, derided, scourged, crucified, um, and, and slain, all of that on this, uh, on this planet that we live in. Um, and and for, for the disciples not to understand this whole thing, um, Jesus is trying to teach them this, um, that this is going to take place. Um, but this is the same Jesus who will one day uh, has been crowned uh, sovereign Lord and King. So the transfiguration is a foreshadow of that event, um, and he ta- he's going to take three people with him. Who's he take with him? Peter, James, and John, right? Only three people are going to see it. Uh, those three men saw in miniature the kingdom of God with power, all right? Uh, so Jesus wanted his disciples to realize the only reason the power of darkness would be able to arrest, try, and crucify him would be if he would let that happen. All right, so we'll read verse 2. Uh, now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So the place, um, we're not told here. It said that it's just a high mar- mountain. We know from other accounts that that is, uh, takes place on Mount, uh, Mount Hermon, uh, which is in the northeast border of uh, Palestine. Um, and it is a mountain that um, tower over uh, the city of Dan. Um, she, Mount Hermon is the most uh, beautiful mountain in Palestine. Uh, Mount Her- uh, Hermon, even in the heat of summer, 
always has snow on it. Um, always has snow on it. Um, it rises to some 10,000 feet. Um, it is uh, uh, the city uh, Caesarea Philippi um, is not very far away. Um, and so Jesus is going to take his friends to this isolated spot. Um, and he is, it says what's going to happen. What does it say is going to happen? Verse 2, what's it say is going to happen? He'll be transfigured. Now, what does that mean? Changed. It's the... Right. It's the Greek word metamorphi, where we get our word metamorphos. Okay? Uh, it means to change the form of appearance. To change the form of appearance. Um, so the transformation that is to take place in the believers be, uh, down here is the same way. Um, it, it's going to involve, and whenever there is a metamorphosis, there are two parts to take place. There is a crisis and there is a process. Um, and that is what should take place in every person who comes to know Jesus Christ's life, that there is a crisis and there is a process. They become, uh, and they begin to change their form. They begin to change their appearance. Their outward appearance and their inward appearance is all changed. Um, notice the plan in verse 3 through 7. Um, and so he's all... He's, he's around these, these mountains, they're white and everything else, and look what happens, verse 3. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. So suddenly his garments turn what? White, right? What's another thing that we say about um, whiteness? Purity, okay? Purity. Um, this is something that, that had never been seen on earth. Um, in Bible times, the process of fully cleaning clothes consisted of taking the garments. This will make you ladies appreciate your laundry machine. Trampling them with your feet or pounding them in tubs of water or upon a rock with a chemical, an alkaline chemical, um, and then they would add nitra and soap. Um, the whitening process included rubbing the garments with chalk or earth of some kind. The process would have been unpleasant. The process would have caused offensive odors. And then it required space for drying your clothes. For these reasons, the trade was usually carried on outside the city, never in the home. Um, so that'll make you appreciate it. But here we see that Jesus is transfigured immediately. Um, his robes are ablaze with white. Um, and with the, 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 the snow on the mountains mixed, mixed in as well, uh, his robe was even whiter than that. Verse 4 um, says, um, And Elijah appeared to them and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. That's a great thing, right? Here you got Jesus there, and all of a sudden Elijah and Moses shows up. Where did they come from? Who invited them? How come he didn't tell us they were coming? We've been prepared, right? Um, and, and, and notice how Mark, for Mark, he, he's he's again saying this from Peter's perspective. Peter's like, and they were just there. They appeared. Um, they were just suddenly uh, coming. Um, what did Moses represent? The law. What did Elijah represent? Uh, close. Prophets. Okay. Um, both men in their day were full of might. They were full of miracles. Right? Moses died. Who buried him? God. God buried him on Mount Nebo. Um, Mo Moses represents the resurrected saints at the rapture. Uh, Elijah was caught up into heaven, um, and he represents the raptured saints caught up into heaven at the rapture. Um, so Peter, whose view of the transfiguration marks recorded here, doesn't tell us what Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking about. Wouldn't you like to know what they were talking about? Yeah? Well, when you get to heaven, you can ask them, right? 
Uh, what were you guys talking about? What was Peter doing? What was Peter doing? Peter was too busy talking. Talking. Um, Luke tells us that they spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter was too busy talking to know what they were talking about. Um, Jesus could have stepped from the Mount of Tra Transfiguration straight into glory before, because, before, um, because the Transfiguration was God's vindication of his um, immaculate, perfect life. So he could have stepped right into glory. But then Moses and Elijah would have had to remain on earth. Elijah to, to die, and then Moses to die again. Um, there would have been no rapture. There would have been no return. There would have been no redemption. Because there would have been no church age. Verse 5. Peter answered. And he said, Jesus... Uh, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. What? Yep. In the yearbook. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, Ed's right. You, you'll be know, known by what you're known, and, and yeah, it's a good question, though. But they had glorified bodies. Right. Peter's was just fleshly bodies. Yeah. True. Maybe Jesus introduced him. If he was a good host, he would have introduced him, right? Yeah. Moses, I'd like you to meet my friend Peter, James, and John. <laughs> That's right. We're going to we're gonna get you some houses up here. Everything's going to be good. Notice what it says about Peter. What does it say about Peter in there? He was terrified. What else does it tell us about Peter? He didn't know what to say, right? What else? Who's talking to Peter? Say it. Say it. Nobody. Nobody was talking to Peter. Why is Peter giving an answer? This is Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Who's Peter? Right? And what's he do? He answers. He speaks up. How many of us can say, I've spoken when I should have been silent? Yeah. Right? Um, Peter's the same way. And he gives this answer. He's like, nobody was talking to him. So he's listening in on their conversation. How could you not? Right? If you were Peter, James, and John, and all of a sudden you're with Jesus, and two guys show up, who you don't know who they are, but... You start listening in, wouldn't you? I would. But I would hope that I'd be like James and John and be silent and listen, not like Peter, and speak up and say, Hey, Lord, let us build you a tent. Um, and so he blurts this out, and what he said on the mount was as bad as what he had said a week before when he rebuked Jesus. Now he's guilty of making the same mistake as the unsaved multitudes who equated Jesus with John the Baptist, Elijah, and others. Peter's putting Jesus in the same par with Elijah and Moses. And so he thought that it would be a good idea to stay on the mountain, so let's build you a, a tent. Um, and I think it's in Luke's account or Mark. Matthew's account, I can't remember which one, but um, it, this is during the time of the, the, um, the Feast of the Tabernacles as well. Um, 
And that's why he's saying, let us build you a tent, tabernacle for you. Um, Verse 6. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Uh, The word afraid implies that they were thrown into this violent fright, okay, this violent fear. Uh, The only other place where that word is found in the New Testament is in, is in describing Moses' terror on Sinai. Uh, motivated by sheer terror, Peter's going to blurt the first thing out that comes into his head. Um, verse 7, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. So, Peter's words... Um, We're so completely on the, the, the vision that it was withdrawn and it was replaced by the voice of the Lord, the voice of God. Um, and w- what is he saying? He's, he's rebuking Peter, and just like Jesus had a, a, a week earlier. And so it's, it's really here, he's, this verse in, 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 is giving God's complete endorsement of the matchless, wonderful life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's focusing the attention on Jesus as the one that we need to hear. There's a lot of voices out there, aren't there? A lot of voices. A lot of loud voices. A lot of them crying, screaming for your attention. The one we need to hear is Jesus. Jesus. Um, this voice was the same voice that had been heard at Jesus' baptism. Um, it was to be heard again by, by the Lord, um, rejected by Israel, anticipated the day when the Gentiles would respond to him, and the overshadowing cloud screened the departure of Moses and Elijah back to heaven. Look at verse 8 and 9. Um, the, notice the person. Suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. It was all over. Moses and Elijah were gone. That moment, gone. No, it wasn't. There was someone there that was greater than Moses and Elijah. It was Jesus. It would have been all over had Jesus been the one to go. If Jesus had been the one to go, we'd have been in deep doo-doo. Right? What need was there for Moses when Jesus was the one who fulfilled the law? What need was there for Elijah when Jesus was the one of whom all the prophets spoke? Far better to have Jesus than Moses. Far better to have Jesus than Moses who is kept out of the promised land for losing his temper or Elijah whose ministry was terminated because he persisted in being depressed as great as these men were they were merely men they were just men Um, Jesus was more than man Jesus was the son of God Um, and neither Moses nor Elijah could bring in the promised kingdom in their day Jesus can and Jesus did. And Jesus will do it again. In verse 9, we see the end of this. And he says, Now as he came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Mount of Transfiguration was the high point, literally, of um, Jesus' pilgrimage here on earth. From now on, his path is going to lead directly to the cross. So that leads me to the question, why? Why did he tell them not to tell anyone? Because you have to imagine that those other nine guys that are down there are down there talking about, hey, here goes the Lord. Here goes Jesus again. He's taking Peter, James, and John. How come he always takes Peter, James, and John? And why why don't we ever get to go? Why does he always choose them? And human nature would be, I'm going to ask them when they get back, what did you see? What happened, right? Are you going to tell Peter, James, and John? 
can you imagine Peter keeping his mouth shut? Right? Why is he telling them not to tell anyone? Look at verse 10, the problem. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. What had they just seen? The transfiguration. Jesus transfigured immediately before their eyes. Moses and Elijah popped in and popped out right before their eyes. And now he's talking about rising from the dead. What is consuming their thoughts at this point? Rising from the dead. Jesus had begun to warn his disciples that he was going to be killed. Peter had rebuked him, right? He had rebuked him. Uh, the additional truth that the Lord was to rise again had not sunk in, nor would it sink in until after what had happened, um, after it all happened. And even then, some of them would be, only be convinced when they saw Jesus. Um, Mary of Bethany, only the Lord's, uh, apart from Mary of Bethany, only the Lord's enemies seemed to have taken his teaching uh, of his resurrection seriously. Possibly Peter and the others had heard Moses and Elijah talking with the Lord about not only his death, but also his resurrection. Um, Elijah had once raised the person from the dead, and the truth of the Lord's resurrection was embedded in Moses' writing. So look at verse 11. In verse 11, um, they, they're still wondering about what's going on. They're keeping this to themselves, and they ask him, saying... Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And that word for asked is in the imperfect tense, which is implying to them that he is, they are asking him continually about this question. Why does it say that Elijah must come first? Why does it say? And they're asking him all the way, over and over and over and over and over again. It's kind of like your child as, they're, as, you're, as you're driving. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are there, right? So the Old Testament ends with a prophecy. Malachi um, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, ends with a prophecy about the coming of Elijah. The, the disciples might have thought that the sudden appearance of Elijah then meant that Elijah had come. Now we know that you're going to set up your kingdom. You're going to fulfill all that prophecy. Everything's going to be great. What do you mean you're going to die? What do you mean you're going to rise again? Okay? So there's confusion on what's going on. And so they're asking this question. The thing is, they don't understand what, what, the, um, what the prophecy was really pointing to and who, who was going to fulfill it. Um, the Bible prophecy, they didn't understand that. And Jesus wasn't going to help them because they, didn't, they weren't prepared to understand that. They weren't prepared to understand uh, biblical prophecy. Um, in Daniel, he tells them to seal it up because... Uh, he didn't, the people weren't ready for that information. They weren't ready to understand it. Um, and John, he said, let the people know. In Revelation, he told John, let the people know. Let everybody know what is going to happen. And Jesus seems really reluctant at this time to share the prophetic things that are going to take place. Um, the disciples were in no condition to, to handle all of the, 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 the intricacies of prophecy relating to the two comings of Christ. Um, I think if Jesus would have explained at this point to um, Peter and James and John about the rapture and the church age and everything else, he would have blown what mind they had left. Uh, they just would not have grasped it. And so they needed to have other things happen before they could grasp hold of it. Um, verse 12 tells us, uh, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? And so the disciples seem to have to ask these questions, um, uh, not only about the prior appearance of Elijah, which the Lord is now uh, about to answer, uh, and other questions about the suffering of the Messiah. Um, as a son of man. So they're, they're going to appeal to things already written. Um, Mark does not say to, that writ, uh, to the written sources that they're referring to, um, but, Jesus, uh, but it does record Jesus' answer to the questions. 
Um, but some of those questions that he's going to answer um, come from Psalm 22, which tells us in, about the, the Messiah who is going to be sacrificed. Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 13. All of those passages would have been familiar to those guys. Um, all of them deal with um, the suffering of the Messiah on the cross and his trials. Verse 13. But I say to you, Elijah has also come. And they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Now these guys knew history. They knew the Israel history. They knew that Elijah had come. They, they were familiar with that. But Jesus is referring to another Elijah that had come. Who's he referring to? Say it again. John the Baptist. He's referring to John the Baptist. Um, not literal Elijah, but he came. He came in the spirit and the power of of Elijah to do what? What was John's message? Repent. Right? Repent. What was Elijah's message? Repent. The whole time he's talking to the nation. Repent from your sin. Repent. Repent. Come back. Remember, Elijah was the one that took on the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Um, and it was, it, it was through that that he, uh, he became popular because he defeated him but he became depressed after that because he was afraid that Jezebel was going to kill him um, so he's going to come uh, had the nation accepted Jesus as Messiah then John's ministry would have made him uh, made him Elijah by proxy um, but the crime of Calvary and the Jews um, rejection of the Holy Spirit necessitated an age-long postponement of the promised messianic millennial kingdom. The Jewish nation today of Israel and the Jews in, in particular are still awaiting their Messiah. They're still awaiting their Messiah. Um, and, and so the, the stage is being set right now for the second coming of Jesus. After the rapture of the church... Uh, Jesus is going to send two witnesses to call the Jewish people back to God before the return of Christ. They, in turn, will have 144,000 converts who will, in turn, take the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. One of those two witnesses, doubtlessly, will be Elijah. The other one, some say, will be Moses. Others think it will be who? He went for more than a day. What was his name? Enoch. Yeah, Enoch. Yeah. Yeah. The other one to be raptured. So some believe it'll be, it'll be Elijah and Moses. Some believe it'll be um, Enoch. I'll let you decide who you think it's going to be. Section 5, then, verse 14 through 29 takes us to the servant's will. What is the will of the servant? Um, verse four, 14 through 16 is the tragic development. Then look at verse 14. He says, and when he came to the disciples, they've all come back, come back down now, and he's coming to his disciples. He saw a great multitude around them, the other nine guys, and scribes doing what? Arguing. Arguing with them. What do you gain from arguing? Thank you. Uh, right? This is a dramatic change of scenery and circumstances. A short while before, Jesus is up on the mountain. He's on the mountain. He's on its climax. There's this great change. Now he comes back down, and what does he see? What does he find? Man arguing. Men arguing. How many times have you been on the mountaintop after a spiritual time of, with God, whether a service, uh, um, a revival, camp, whatever, and you come back to the next day to an argument or issues or problems or you, you whatever, right? 
It's always that way. Um, they had come down from the mountain to this world in Satan's iron grip. And it's a world that challenged and mocked and warred. All there, the other disciples were locked in futile fighting with the scribes while a skeptical, rootless multitude milled around. And even at the first glance, it's evident that the disciples without Christ were out of their depth. Uh, how often we have been powerless as they were. How often have we tried to do something in our own power only to find that we are powerless and incapable of handling it. We need the Lord. And in verse 15, the Lord had come. It says, immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed. Why? Why were they amazed? Okay. Because he had changed. Yeah. There's this white. He, whoa. He'd gone up and he was Jesus. He came back and he's all white. And there's a, there's a change there. And he's come back and all is, all is well. Right? In verse 15. Um, they're greatly amazed. So and they run to him and they, they greet him. Right? That, that, that whole idea, they were greatly amazed. They were awed. That word used means they were greatly astonished. And only Mark is the one that uses that word. It occurs here and in two other places. It occurs in Gethsemane in chapter 14 and at the empty tomb in chapter 16. Something of the awesome glory of his transfiguration must have still lingered about the, the person of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 16. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? What are you discussing with them? Verse 17. The one of, then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Verse 18. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. So what do we see? First of all, we see this demon is, this boy is demon possessed. And we see this sad father. The boy is in desperate need. Um, and it's so graphic. Um, it's vivid. Mark is telling us in detail what's taken place. Um, the demon said the distraught father takes him. The idea is, the word there is catalabano, from which we get our English word catalepsy. Um, epilepsy. It's kind of a form of epilepsy to seize hold of uh, someone or something. So as it makes it its own. And it says he, he tears him. He tears him. The idea is that the fierce demon would, would take this boy and throw him violently onto the ground. Um, it means that this boy would have, um, w w would convulse and to distort. Okay? And so he would take him and throw him on the ground. But also he tells us something else in verse 18. He throws him down and he does what? He foams at the mouth like a mad dog. He gnashes with his teeth. And that word gnashes is the word trizo, and it suggests a shrill cry comes out of him. Um, as a result of these hideous contortions and suffering, the boy is just wasting away. He's wasting away. And to waste away means he's withering like the grass when it's not raining. Um, the boy is unable to speak, unable to say a word to his parents, unable to express his sufferings. And the boy's father had thought, if I can get him to Jesus, if I can just get him to Jesus. So when he went to find Jesus, he was unable to find him because Jesus was up on the mountaintop. So he, he asked his disciples. And he brought, brought them to his disciples only to find out that they might just as well have stayed home. Look at the sobering failure in verse 19. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. 
Jesus had given his disciples recently um, authority over unclean spirits. But this one was different. So he says, bring him to me. How do you think the father felt about that? Think that would have been, you know, good? Yeah, I think so. Um, Verse 20 through 22, we see a satanic fiend. 20. uh, Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit did what? He convulsed. He convulsed the boy, right? And he caused him to fall on the ground and wallowed and foaming at the mouth. And so he, he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Now Jesus had seen all these demons before, and all these other demons, remember he, he, he just talked to them, and what they do? They might violently one time and then leave. They obeyed. They did it. But this guy... This one, whatever it is, whatever demon it is, and we don't understand the demonic world like, like maybe we should a little bit more, but they are real, and they are terrifying. Um, and this one seems to have had more power than others. But notice what he says in verse 21. When did this thing start? From when? From his childhood, right? Yeah. From when he was a little boy, a little tiny fella, it start. Um, and, and so Jesus is going to have compassion on this little fella. And the demon, not content with inflicting, inflicting this child with dumbness and tearing him with convulsions, tried more than once to do what? To what? To kill him, right? Throw him in fire, drown him. I mean, wh- let's get rid of this child, right? Um, and so it, it, would you say this, this demon is an evil spirit? I, I, I would think... Yeah, I I think he's probably one of the worst. Verse 22, at the end, he says, But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Does he have faith? Yeah, he does. He's got some skeptical skepticism because he had just taken them to Jesus' disciples, and they hadn't been able to do anything. But he said, you know, if you can. And, And I think sometimes our faith is shaken to the core. And we say to God, God, if you can do anything to help me, please, Jesus, if you can do it, help me. And Jesus can do it. Don't, don't read my notes. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, 23. Jesus said, if you can believe, what? All things are possible. That's right. All things are possible to him who believes. Right? If. Right? So what's Jesus doing? He's throwing that word back at him, if you can believe. Could Jesus handle it? Yeah. If Jesus can create this world and all the universe and the galaxies, the billion galaxies, the billion stars, he can handle a wild demon. Verse 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You ever cried that? Yeah, that word help literally means he's running, he's crying to him. Um, The father confessed. He needed help. There's many times in our life we need help too. We need help too. This boy was just a little boy, a little more than an infant. Just leave the children alone, right? Just leave the children alone. What what does Jesus say about children? Suffer them to come unto me, right? Right. Man, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, they're all precious, right? I heard, uh, I was listening to the convention this week. I think it was yesterday, the speaker. I think it was J.D. Greer. Was it J.D.? I don't remember. uh, Whoever it was was speaking said, um, um, talking about the critical race theory, and he said, you know, with God, there's only one race. It's the human race. 
and he died for all of them. This spirit, this demon is evil and he terrorizes children. Shame on any person who terrorizes children. Shame on them. Verse 25 through 27, we see the saving friend. When Jesus saw that the, that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. That word I is emphatic. This isn't, this isn't Peter telling him to leave, or James or John or any of the other uh, disciples. This is Jesus. I command you. That wicked spirit is not up against Matthew the tax collector. He's not up against Thomas the doubter, James the less, Peter, he, or anybody else. He is up against all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all-everything Jesus. And this spirit, even though he's a foul spirit, means, it means corrupt. This spirit, deaf and dumb spirit, probably because it had the power to inflict deafness and dumbness on its victim. Demons are incorrigible beyond all hope of reformation. And this demon had already demonstrated its tenacity and its defiance, but Jesus slammed the door on the thought that this foul thing had any power over this child. How do we know that? Because what did he say at the end? Enter him no more. You know what he did? He gave, him, he gave him a fresh, fresh, new life. Um, here it was, what a relief to the boy's father to know that I have my son. I now have my son. Verse 26, then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and did what? Came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. It was the last savage, spiteful act of this ferocious demon. He left the boy. For what? As what? As dead. Or so he hoped, right? But we know that with Jesus there is life. Verse 27 says, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. Right? He arose. You think that boy or that father ever forgot that? No way. No way. This. Can you imagine that boy telling him, I, you know, if he's four, if he's Jackson's age or five, and he says, man, I don't remember all of the details. I don't remember everything that happened. But my dad told me that I was de dead or looked like I was dead. And Jesus touched me with his strong hand and pulled me up and I'm a new man I became new, everything was new it was great, it was wonderful that's what Jesus does for us and he gives us newness of life aren't you thankful aren't you thankful that Jesus gives us life and gives it to us eternally amen, amen let's look at our prayer sheet Okay, we've added uh, Bethany on there, um, Bethany Davis on there. So please keep praying for her um, and continue to pray for Cotton. She recovers. Okay, what else? Charlie? Close tomorrow? Okay. And her name again? Yeah. Okay. 
his mother Joyce, Rick Smith, his brother, and Sandra Thompson, his sister, who has a broken leg and having issues with that. Yes, sir. Do what? U T A H O N A. Okay. We'll be. Yes. Did you know Desi's going yeah. to mess with you? Okay, I didn't, you weren't you weren't here. You were out trying to get a hole in one. All right. I'm glad. Okay. Anything else? How did he do? Okay. Okay. Good. You know, my sisters were. My sisters would probably say the same thing about me, but that's not true. Anything else? Okay, let's go ahead and pray silently, and I'll close in a few moments. Father, thank you for another night to be able just to share and to pray and to seek your face. Lord, I just thank you that you are an almighty God who loves us and um, cares about all the little things that we have going on in our life. Lord, I thank you that you are holy and righteous Father, I pray that you would forgive us of the areas that we have sinned against you and failed. Um, Father, I pray that you would forgive us of the areas that we have um, sinned against you or, or, or sinned and didn't know about it, Lord. Um, we just ask your forgiveness. Help us, Father, to walk closer to you, to draw near to you, um, and to just believe and trust that no matter what, uh, Father, you are you are on the throne. And uh, it doesn't matter what happens, who's in charge or who thinks they're in charge, Lord. We know who really is, um, and that is you. 
And so we can trust you and, and just lean on you, and Lord, we praise you for it. We thank you for all that you do for us. We pray, Father God, that you would um, just hear our request that we have tonight, Lord. We um, have uh, some requests for healing for uh, those that may have tests or surgery. We think of um, Rick, uh, Rick Smith, uh, Charlie's brother, um, and his mom, um, Joyce, who's having some a procedure done tomorrow, and his sister, who's had a broken leg and is trying to heal, Lord, I just pray she'd stay off it so it'll heal properly. Uh, Father, for Linda Williams' mother, as she's dealing with some confusion, um, and just give Linda the strength that she needs um, as she's working with her and taking care of her. Thank you for the good report on Vile's brother. Um, continue to pray for him as he recovers, for Cotton as she continues to recover. We thank you for uh, for that, and just pray that you continue to strengthen her each and every day, Lord. Um, we pray, Father, for Desi as she travels this weekend, uh, that you give her traveling uh, mercies, and then, Lord, that you would uh, just use her mightily at this camp uh, for your glory. Uh, Father, help her, uh, just give her wisdom as she's dealing with campers and uh, counselors who might be coming in for physical problems, Lord. We pray that you would give her grace and wisdom and strength and father we thank you for this thank you for your love lord be with our missionaries uh help them to draw near to you thank you for loving us thank you for your mercy and grace um and just thank you for our church lord as we prepare for this weekend um with uh, april's closet i just pray lord that you would help us to be uh witnesses um and Lord, to share the, the good news of Jesus um, with people. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Um, thank you for your mercy. Uh, thank you for all that you do for us. And thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we serve a risen Savior. And we know that he's in our hearts and he's in our lives. And uh, that, uh, Father, through your word, we can uh, change not only our hearts, but change the hearts of others because your word is powerful and great. And may the Holy Spirit work in people's hearts as we uh, tell them about you. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. All right, just a reminder, Sunday night, of course, is church. But we have the uh, clothing drive this weekend, April's Closet, Thursday. Um, she starts setting up Thursday afternoon, I think, and then Friday all day, and then Saturday um, morning starts at 8. Is that correct? Yes, starts at 8. Um, so I encourage you to take part in that. Um, I think that's about it. Men's Bible study Monday. If you don't have the study, it's out there. It's on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, good time to get in. Don't be late. We are not, we are working this weekend at the clothing drive. No. We're waiting for the ladies to do their part. The men already did their part. We're just waiting for the ladies to put the, the metal on the roof and we'll be good. The concrete, yeah. The easy stuff, yeah. Shoo! All right, God bless y'all. Have a great week.